Welcome everyone, Russ Barkley here, and in this short video, I want to describe for you what I think an executive function is, what is executive functioning generally, and we're going to view this from the perspective of my theory of executive functioning and ADHD. Now, this has all been described in my books uh, that I've published over the years. Uh, the first book was in 1997, and it was called ADHD and the Nature of Self-Control, where I described this theory. Uh, I then uh, republished the theory in 2001 in the paperback version of that with an update. Uh, and then I wrote another book in 2012 on the executive functions, what they are, how they work, and why they evolved. So I've been working in this field for well over 20 years now, trying to develop a useful, scientific, operational definition of executive functioning and a theory of how this develops and works and what goes wrong in ADHD. So uh, here I just want to talk very quickly about the nature of an executive function. Despite the fact that there's 20 to 30 definitions of executive functioning, they all come back to one common idea. Executive functioning is those mental abilities necessary for goal-directed action. So obviously, executive functioning is future-oriented, but this definition doesn't help us because it doesn't tell us what are these mental abilities? Why are they considered executive in nature when many other mental abilities are not? And the definition can't help us out there. So that's why we need an operational definition. So I came up with one. I've been writing about it for 20 years, and here we go. An executive function is a mental capacity necessary for self-regulation. In fact, it is self-regulation. Very few neuropsychologists would disagree with that statement that EFs, the executive functions, are needed for SR, self-regulation. Still doesn't help us out though. However, we can take the definition of self-regulation and we can work through that to a definition of an executive function. So here's what I did in my books. Self-regulation can be defined as three parts, three things. An action that we direct at ourselves. Why would we do that? Very few of any organisms do that. Because we're trying to change our subsequent behavior. Why would we want to change what we're about to do? So as to make a delay, delayed consequence more or less likely to occur. So an action at the self that we're trying to use to change our behavior in order to change our future, to improve our future. So self-regulation is about self-improvement over time in support of our long-term welfare. It is effortful. It exacts a cost on the organism, on the individual for using it. It's not just something that happens automatically. Okay, so if that's self-regulation, what then is an executive function? It's the action we direct at ourselves. Step one in the definition of self-regulation. What are you doing to yourself in hopes of altering your behavior so as to have a better future for yourself? What are you doing? That action to the self is what I call an executive function. Now, we know that there are seven major executive functions as neuropsychology accepts them. But neuropsychology uses different terms than what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the common terms for these seven components and redefine them as actions to the self. And what are we doing? That should help us understand what these seven major executive functions are. It's likely that each of, each of them develops according to the same process. A behavior we use to the environment, we then take and use on ourselves to change ourselves. Over time, this behavior to the self becomes less observable and more internalized. That is, we inhibit the external action while still engaging 
in the mental action. Kind of looks like this. Initially, young children are stimulus response creatures. Events happen and our brains, ourselves, responds to those events. This is externally governed, externally directed action toward events. But later in early childhood, the individual starts to turn the action on themselves so that an event happens, they have a mental representation about that event, and they use that to change themselves, to change their behavior. This is all going on up in that frontal executive part of the brain. So self-directed actions start to occur based on mental representations concerning them. We think about something and we then do it. Okay. Finally, over time, these actions to the self that other people can observe become private, internal. The external part is inhibited so that what we're thinking about doesn't automatically trigger the spinal cord to engage in that action. There is a gatekeeper here that keeps the actions mental. We can think about doing something and not necessarily be doing it while we're thinking about it. Uh, and it doesn't matter what that part of the brain is. I think it's the basal ganglia, but it doesn't really matter. So we can think about things, plan our actions, weigh which one might work, and then finally execute that action. All of that is a form of private simulation. Now, I know this is very esoteric. Let me give an example. We're going to use how children go from talking to having a voice in their head, private speech. So between zero and three, a young child is talking to the environment. There is no mental going on. It's just speech to the environment. But right around three years of age, between three and five, you're gonna to start to see this child talking to themselves out loud. So they're now saying something to themselves. It's usually something description. If you listen to a child in their room by themselves at bed at night, they're talking and it's usually just description. But eventually, this moves to being instruction. They start to tell themselves what to do. But we can hear it, we can see it, and that's gonna go on until they're about seven or eight years of age when we start to see the speech become gradually suppressed and internalized. You start to see children, instead of talking out loud, they whisper. Still talking, but you can't hear it. Eventually, they're able to suppress the peripheral muscles of the mouth and the larynx while still talking in their head. And now they have a voice in the head as represented over here. So, speech to others becomes speech to the self, becomes private speech for self-regulation. My theory says that each of the seven executive functions follows this same sequence. There are actions to the self that are made internal over development. By adulthood, we have a suite, a Swiss army knife of mind tools that we can use for self-regulation. So to reiterate, three important things going on here. The action is being self-directed. This is part of my theory and no one else's theory. I borrowed the idea from Vygotsky's model of how speech becomes thought. So self-directed action, just as important. This eventually becomes private. Through inhibition of the spine and the peripheral muscles, we stop the public action, but we still can engage in the private action in the brain. And most important, overdevelopment these self-directed actions, especially the mental actions, come to govern our behavior. We do what we think. And that becomes an important form of private simulation of our actions. So they develop in a stepwise sequence. The age doesn't matter, but it's gonna start in the preschool years. Here are the seven executive functions and I redefine them. Self-awareness, which is self-directed attention, starts very early. Then we get into inhibition, which is self-restraint. 
Then we get into visual imagery and the broader area of self-directed sensing. That's nonverbal working memory. We imagine things in our mind. Then we talk to ourselves. That's self-speech. We eventually use all four of those to regulate and manage our emotions. And as a result, we get self-motivation. Finally, we develop the ability to manipulate what we're holding in mind in our verbal and nonverbal working memory systems. And that allows us to engage in problem solving, creativity, coming up with new solutions. I believe this is a form of self-directed play. It's based on earlier forms of physical play in childhood where we manipulate the environment to see what happens. And I believe that eventually becomes a private form of play leading to planning and problem solving. Now, these seven executive functions, which become internal during the first 24 to 30 years of our life, are interactive by adulthood. They combine like a symphony, if you will, and they allow us to self-regulate over time toward our goals. Mental representations are being used to guide public behavior. So the seven cognitive executive functions then lead to what I call the five EFs of daily life, the things that other people see you do. I can't see what's going on in your mind, but I can infer it from how you act. So this is what is often measured by rating scales of EF such as my own. Inhibition or self-restraint, time management, self-organization, problem solving, self-motivation, and emotional self-regulation. ADHD disrupts all seven of the cognitive executive functions to varying degrees, leading to a disruption of all five of the executive functions in daily life to varying degrees, depending on severity of disorder and other attributes, that is, other psychological abilities of the individual. So there you have it. That's my definition of an executive function. It's how I created my theory of executive functioning, and it's how I then extrapolated this to understanding the true nature of ADHD. So thanks for joining me, everybody. I hope you learned something from this short video. Have a look at my longer videos on the topic of executive functioning if you wish to know more. Thanks for joining me and be well.